So, hello everyone uh, and welcome to our Phenomics webinars live Q&A interview session. My name is Philipp von Gillhausen and the Phenomics webinars are brought to you by the International Plant Phenotyping Network, for which I work, the European um, Plant Phenotyping Network emphasis and the European Infrastructure Access Project EPPN 2020. Today's uh, live Q&A will be on the topic of high throughput estimates of radiation interception and radiation use efficiency in wheat crops. Um, and um, with me today is Dr. Frederick, uh, Frederick Bure. On his behalf, he's a research director of INRAE in France uh, to provide you answers to your questions uh, and um, giving us the opportunity of an in-depth discussions on the topic of his pre-recorded work um, video that you have seen in the past two weeks on our websites. Hello, Fred, welcome. Hello, Philippe. <laughs> yeah, so uh, I'm pleased to, um, to be with you today, <laughs> virtually, unfortunately. Yes, I, uh, I hope there will be the opportunity to meet uh, live once in the future, maybe. But for today, I'm very happy to have you here also virtually. Fred, well, you are research director in, at INRAE in France, and uh, you are invited professor at Nanjing Agricultural University today. You are considered one of the pioneers of remote sensing uh, for ag and plant science applications. And you have started your career in remote sensing at a time where most of at least my peers haven't even been to school yet. In uh, 1986, you did your uh, PhD in uh, remote sensing and um, well, today, your main focus of research is um, can be seen in the area of plant phenotyping and uh, the application of plant phenotyping and at best the application of the results obtained through uh, high throughput phenotyping. So can you describe us uh, a few key points of your career to uh, our audience uh, in order to get to know you a little bit better? Yes, yeah, so maybe I, I started by um, working at close round remote sensing that was at that time not not to, not called uh, phenotyping. Uh, I was working in a research institute actually not, now it's called Arvalis, but at that time it was another name. And so working very close to the plants to, to understand the, how they were uh, functioning. And uh, then I, I joined INRA and I continued to work, uh, let's say, at close range uh, remote sensing up to uh, around 2000. Uh, because at that time, the uh, satellite imagery was not uh, easy to, to get. And there was also a lot of uh, work to conduct to, to understand uh, what was the signal um, of the satellites and how we can exploit it. And after 2000, I uh, started to work with imagery. <laughs> so mostly at course resolution uh, uh, data because uh, this was the data that were available and there was uh, no, let's say true products, products like uh, estimates of uh, uh, structural characteristics of, of, uh, of the vegetation. And this uh, was uh, going on up to let's say around 2010 uh, where Progressively, uh, progressively, I was coming back uh, closer to, to, to the ground uh, by uh, using uh, decametric observations, uh, Sentinel-2, of course, mm -hmm. um, Landsat, um, which is uh, more useful for monitoring crops because it uh, allows to, uh, <clears throat> to look within the field. And uh, at the same time, there were some, some projects starting, uh, like the, the uh, Phenome project in France, which is a big project, where I was involved uh, from the beginning. And at the beginning, I was trying to, uh, to apply uh, remote sensing techniques to, to phenotyping. 
Of course, it's working, but it was quite limited actually. And uh, and so we, we developed uh, other methods and other instrumentation. Uh, and now um, we have access to many more traits uh, with uh, much more reliable traits. And we are trying to use these uh, observations to, um, to better understand the functioning of the crop as well uh, by using, by combining these observations with uh, crop models. Uh, so that's, that's the objective. So of course, it's uh, the start of this, uh, let's say, uh, research orientation. Um, but I think it's, it's uh, quite promising because it allows to, uh, let's say, to formalize our observations um, uh, into, into uh, let's say, models that, um, that, that, that are based on some understanding of the uh, main processes of uh, crop functioning. And so there are, there are hope to, to use these models to, uh, to try to, to access to functioning traits, uh, functional traits, uh, as opposed to the uh, more or less structural or biochemical traits that we can get uh, up to now with, uh, let's say, snapshot observations. So that's, that's more or less um, that's the uh, <laughs> Yes, which uh, poses a very nice uh, transition. Um, so you said um, you are investigating uh, crop functions uh, on behalf of parameters that uh, have been uh, obtained via high throughput plant phenotyping. Uh, and this is, of course, also um, subject of your talk uh, today. So you used um, these parameters um, to estimate radiation use um, efficiency in, for example, crop uh, stands. Uh, could you summarize uh, maybe the, the content of the talk provided by you uh, shortly? Okay. <clears throat> so um, I've prepared, I don't know if I've got something like 10 minutes, it's okay? Absolutely. Because, okay, Ten I've prepared, uh, let's say, uh, an abstract of the full presentation. So maybe it will be more, so I, I can try to share that. Yes, um, I will switch out my video, then people can see it completely. Okay. And later on, I'll join you again. The stage I, is I think, I think you should allow me to share my screen. <laughs> um, Yep, I will. <clears throat> so now that should work. Ah, uh, yes. Okay, good. Uh, what is it? Okay, so can you see it? Not yet. Uh, ah, yes, now. Now we yes, see it. It's... Perfect. Okay, good. So I can I can start. So the the, the subject of the talk today is to uh, show how we can estimate uh, radiation interception and use efficiency uh, for wheat crops from um, phenotyping observations. So it's a work that uh, uh, associates uh, different uh, co-authors like Xu Yang Liu, in, who is now in, in Nanjing in China, Marie Weiss, uh, Bedouin de Solan, and, uh, who are in Avignon, and Pierre Martre, who is in Montpellier. Uh, it's in red. Uh, okay, I don't know why it's ah, okay. It's coming. So, uh, so so we for that we use a very simple efficiency model to describe the above ground dry matter uh, or dry mass. Um, it's a model that has been proposed by Montes uh, a long time ago. Mm -hmm. And that says that uh, the total biomass accumulated during a time period equals the product between the radiation use efficiency multiplied by 
the, the total amount of uh, absorbed or intercepted uh, uh, photosynthetically active radiation absorbed by, by the uh, well, intercepted by the canopy. So in this simple equation, uh, I multiply, of course, by, by the uh, uh, so so this sorry this this uh, radiation that is intercepted by by the canopy multiplied by the incoming uh, radiation, uh, which is called here the, the par uh, incoming par par e. Um, so from that uh, we we can uh, get some estimates of the uh, radiation use efficiency. If we know, of course, uh, the uh, total amount of biomass, and if we know the, the total amount of uh, intercept, intercepted the radiation. Um, so the total amount of biomass currently is something that we can uh, measure uh, from destructive measurements. Sorry. I uh, see. No, this way. And the, um, the total amount of accumulated, uh, intercepted uh, photosynthetically active radiation uh, can be measured by the two terms. So one is the incoming radiation that is uh, currently uh, measured by most uh, meteorological uh, synoptic stations. And the other is the fraction of intercepted radiation that can be fraction of depends both on the elimination conditions and canopy architecture. Uh, so for the elimination conditions are mostly characterized by the uh, sun position and the uh, fraction of direct uh, radiation. And the um, canopy architecture can be uh, simply uh, characterized by the green area index that intercepts uh, the, the uh, radiation that is useful for photosynthesis and the uh, average inclination angle of the leaves or the stems, so all the green parts. And you can see on the graphs on, on the uh, right that the fraction of intercepted radiation uh, varies during the day depending on the uh, sun position and uh, the fraction of direct radiation. So you have on the top uh, a typical situation for sunny conditions. Um, and on, on the bottom, a uh, typical situation for cloudy conditions where the FEPAR, uh, FEPAR actually the fraction of intercepted radiation, uh, is about constant because uh, it doesn't depend, it's under diffuse uh, conditions because it's cloudy uh, days. It doesn't depend on the sun position, so it doesn't depend too much uh, on the time in the day. But of course, the, the amount of radiation depends on the time. Uh, uh, on the day. Uh, so the other way. Okay, so we can uh, characterize with uh, high throughput measurements the green area index and the average inclination angle from the measurement of the green fraction. So the green fraction is a fraction of, of a green uh, area uh, over one image in a given direction. Um, and this uh, fraction of uh, this green fraction, actually, it's uh, the fraction of intercepted radiation in the same direction. So it, it's the same, uh, same concept, same quantity. And this uh, green fraction can be related to the green R index and the average inclination angle through this uh, simple equation here. It's a, it's a Poisson model that assumes that uh, the the canopy is uh, a turbine medium. That means the uh, leaves are randomly distributed in the canopy volume. Um, so uh, based on this uh, description of uh, the, the relationship between the green fraction and the uh, green R index and average inclination angle, if you measure the green fraction in two directions, um, in two optimal directions that are zero degree and 45 degrees, you are able to estimate with a quite good accuracy the green R index and the average uh, inclination angle. Yeah, right. Of course, the average leaf angle is a bit less uh, accurately estimated, but it's also less sensitive on the fraction of intercepted radiation. So it's uh, okay. So uh, finally, even if it's not very well uh, 
uh, estimated the consequences on the estimation of the fraction intercepted the fraction of intercepted radiation is uh, is marginal uh, so the grain fraction can be measured from uh, different uh, sensors, uh, film typing sensors. So of course, can be high resolution RGB imagery by classifying the green pixels. It can be a multispectral imagery. Uh, sorry, uh, multispectral imagery uh, by uh, calibrating empirical uh, uh, transfer functions that relate, uh, for example, vegetation indices to the green fraction. It can be also uh, based on the LiDAR uh, 3D point um, because there are big differences uh, between uh, leaves and, and soil. So once you have measured the grain fraction, you are able to estimate uh, the green area index and the uh, average inclination angle and to combine them into an estimate of the fraction of intercepted radiation. And it shows here on the, on the left the, the goodness of the fit between uh, the reference fraction of intercepted radiation and the one that is estimated from the green fraction uh, measured at zero degree and 45 degree. And this, this was coming on, on the left from model simulations, but we can uh, we have validated that uh, in, uh, let's say in, in, uh, in the field. And we see that we have got uh, also quite a, a nice uh, uh, fit between the observations and, and the estimation of the fraction of intercepted radiation. Uh, then we can make fin measurements of the green fraction in those two directions with a range of sensors, uh, as it is shown here. So it can be with a handheld uh, system uh, called literal. It can be with a tractor-based uh, system where you have the nadir and the 45 degree angle uh, sensors. It can be with phenomobile, again, with nadir and 45 degrees uh, angle sensors. It can be also with a gantry system. And from that, you can derive the dynamics uh, at a certain time of measurements of the green fraction in the two directions of zero degree and, and, and 45 degree. So this is some examples here on some experiments uh, in south of France uh, over wheat where we derive uh, estimates of the green fraction at zero degree and 45 degree. From, ta from that, uh, we can, uh, it's not passing to the next one, okay. From that, we can estimate, uh, as I told uh, previously, uh, the green R index and the average inclination angle uh, and get uh, some, some estimate of the dynamics uh, throughout the growing cycle. And, and then uh, combining them in, into this equation to estimate the fraction of intercepted radiation for each uh, time in the day and time in the season. Um, this allows to, uh, to compute the fraction of intercepted radiation during the whole season. Uh, so we can, we can go to the, uh, let's say the, the full scheme here. So we start by the measurements of the green R index of, of the green fraction, sorry, with the uh, phenotyping systems uh, at a given uh, discrete time measurements. Uh, so it's snapshots uh, measurement, measurements where we have a few dates of green R index and the average inclination angle values. Uh, from that, we can, uh, okay, it doesn't want to, uh, to go to the next one. Okay, ah, it stopped, I don't know why. Ah, okay, take some time. Then we can interpolate uh, with time uh, during the observations to get a continuous uh, estimates of the green R index and the average inclination angle. Um, and from that, combine them into this equation to get a continuous estimate of the fraction of intercepted radiation depending on the uh, sun position of the fraction of uh, uh, direct radiation and that is measured by synoptic uh, meteorological stations. Uh, from that, we uh, combine that into, we, we uh, accumulate the values uh, during the day and during the season um, to get the, the, the cumulated amount of intercepted radiation. Um, and finally, if we have got measurement uh, from time to time 
of the uh, biomass, uh, we can compute the radiation use efficiency according to the uh, equation here. Um, okay, so that's that's quite uh, simple. So these are, if it wants to go to the next one, these are some results here uh, where we have two modalities. One is uh, irrigated, the other is uh, non-irrigated. And we have the uh, radiation use efficiency expressed in gram of biomass per megajoule of uh, intercepted photosynthetically active, active radiation. We have here different uh, cultivars and the two, uh, the two modalities. And we see that we are able to, uh, to find some differences in the radiation use efficiency between cultivars and, and also between uh, irrigated, uh, between modalities, sorry. And this allows to, uh, to better understand how the, uh, the crops are uh, responding to the environment. So the main um, problem here, of course, is that you need to, um, to get the biomass, uh, high throughput biomass um, measurements if you want to, to get frequent uh, estimates of the radiation use efficiency. So currently, the methods that are used for biomass measurements are destructive measurements. So uh, they are interesting because uh, generally there are no bias, but because it's made on limited uh, sampling area, we have problems of uh, spatial rep representativeness. It's of course low throughput, uh, expensive, and it's destructive. That means that if you want to, to make uh, estimates of radiation use efficiency at different time step during the growth cycle, you will destroy the quite a significant uh, part of your microplot. So we, we can think of replacing those low throughput measurements by high throughput ones or higher throughput ones. So it can be uh, to design a robot that makes those destructive measurements. So of course, you will have no bias. You will improve the throughput but the problem is that uh, the system is not yet uh, existing. So we are working on developing uh, something like that, but it's not yet uh, ready. And finally, we, we can think to, to use indirect methods uh, based on allometry. That means we measure surface or, or volume of, of the organs or of the plant in the canopy. And from that, we can derive estimate of the, bi of the biomass of the mass. So it, it will be high throughput. It will be non-destructive, affordable, of course, because it's uh, high throughput. Um, but it always needs uh, to be calibrated on a significant amount of samples. And there might be some bias because of the relationship between, uh, let's say, the surface and, and the mass, or the volume and the mass, depends on, the let's say, the density of the elements that may change. Um, depending on the uh, stage and, and probably uh, on the uh, genotype. So this has to be uh, further investigated. So I'm coming to the uh, conclusion. Um, if the system is working, okay. So we uh, propose a scheme to estimate the canopy structure uh, from green fraction measured in two directions. Uh, so the canopy structure is mostly the green R index and the average inclination angle. Um, this can be, uh, this green fraction can be derived from several systems that we demonstrated from RGB images, from multispectral or from LIDAR measurements. Um, uh, the, um, if, if you make a during medium assumption, which is uh, quite, which applies quite well to wheat crops, but maybe not to all the crops, you can easily compute the fraction of intercepted radiation from uh, the green fraction through the estimates of the green R index and average inclination angle. And if you, if you have uh, measurements available of biomass, you can estimate the radiation use efficiency. Uh, so the, the main limiting factor, as we discussed previously, of course, is the availability of high throughput and unbiased estimates of the biomass that will uh, allow to provide the uh, statistics on the radiation use efficiency. For example, to try to uh, estimate the irritability of the radiation use efficiency and to investigate more the variability of this radiation use efficiency. 
between germ types, between uh, depending on the environmental conditions. And it's also very interesting, uh, especially if we want to, uh, to, to use uh, growth, uh, crop growth models, because uh, crop growth models uh, are based or are, have at least the ability to uh, estimate the radiation use efficiency. And we could um, compare uh, the measured values to, to the one simulated by a radio model and, and try to refine and to improve uh, the, the, the models. So I thank you for, uh, for, for, for your attention. And this is the end of this uh, uh, presentation. But not yet the end of the discussion. Uh, this will begin only now. Thank you very much for this comprehensive overview of the topic of your talk. Whoever wants to uh, um, see the talk once more into, uh, in, in more detail, um, feel free to visit our YouTube channel. Um, the, the talk can be seen and also the recordings of this Q&A will be uh, posted on YouTube uh, on our IPPN channel and soon also probably on an own phenomics webinars channel um, but uh, well let's get back to the topic um, Fred um, one thing that uh, struck my my mind uh, during uh, your um, presentation but also during this um, summary now is that in order to uh, come from um, your your modeled um, light interception um, to um, resource uh, use interception, you would use uh, uh, a bio, biomass estimation of the plots investigated and of the cultivars. Um, that to me sounds a little bit like you, you need, um, or as you have stated, that um, if you use an indirect method, which would be most applicable in high throughput uh, phenotyping um, um, areas um, that you would you uh, th that you would need a, a biomass model to to um, supplement your um, light interception or resource use uh, efficiency model so what would you say um, is currently the best um, way to uh, obtain um, or to measure biomass um, via via plant phenotyping methods Oh, yeah, that, that's a difficult question. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, so the, in the literature, you can find some uh, some publication that uh, that, that propose some, let's say, uh, empirical relationships uh, between the biomass that is measured destructively and uh, some high throughput uh, uh, traits. So generally, it's, uh, so it depends. It can be, uh, let's say, the, the lidar, uh, the, the some kind of integration of the lidar um, uh, point clouds. Yes, it can be uh, relationships with uh, with the shoots, uh, the aerial uh, basis of the, of the shoots for for wheat, for example. It can be any other, let's say, um, dimension uh, of the. Um, uh, of the plants of the canopy, it can be a combination of all these things, uh, and and it has been shown that there was a quite quite strong relation. That's true, but my uh, and that's that has been that hasn't been very well discussed in all these publications. There might be some residual uh, genotypic effects. Uh, so that means, of course, you you could uh, you could. Um, let's say, get a, a gross uh, classification between uh, um, uh, genotypes that are, or, or plots that, are, uh, that have a high uh, radiation use efficiency or high biomass, if you want, and, and those who have a low one. But I'm not sure that you, are, you will be fine enough uh, or precise enough to get uh, the differences that might be uh, small between uh, the different germ types. And so that, that's what has to be proven. Uh, are the high throughput um, estimates of biomass unbiased 
uh, from possible genotypic effects because mm -hmm. these are indirect relationships and you are never sure that uh, either some uh, canopy architecture features or I don't know density features or whatever may uh, impact your estimates of the biomass. Of course, um, genetic or differences or in in effects uh, due to differences in the genetics of the of the uh, investigated cultivars um, cannot on never fully be ruled out. How is it? Um, for example, when you consider imaging, yeah, you, you said that uh, the resolution of the images would be a key role, but there are inherent problems with uh, imaging itself, such as, for example, occlusion. Um, so so um, that you cannot, you, that you cannot uh, see through the leaves and therefore uh, every leaf that is behind a leaf, so, so to say, is more or less uh, invisible to the, to the camera. Yeah, and therefore can, of course, pose uh, a bias uh, um, itself uh, for, for calculating the true biomass of a given plot via I imaging techniques. Yes, yes, true. Now that's, that's one problem, but uh, yes, yeah, so, so if, you, if, you, uh, if you see just part of the, of the canopy, of course, you have to, uh, to have um, a strong correlation between the visible parts and the one that you don't see. Uh, but even for the visible parts, there are still the problem to uh, transform either surfaces or volumes of what you can see into biomass. Uh, and this is not straightforward because mm. they are, okay, it's uh, volume between, the, the ratio between volume and, and the biomass, it's uh, the density that may vary. And from surface and, and biomass, it's even more difficult. So. Uh, that's that's my limitation. Okay, Fred. Um, thanks so far. Um, we have been sent uh, a couple of questions uh, via email, but first I would like to um, um, give um, our viewers that are currently with us here the chance to to ask their questions. Um, in that sense, I have one question here from uh, Felix Arkins. And maybe he's uh, able to ask the question himself. I will try this out via the uh, answer in real time uh, function here. If that does not work, I will read the question out loud. So the question was. Um, it was about the resolution, the spatial resolution, from what um, we can understand. The yes. Yes, How it, many samples are usually needed for calibration and what specifications are needed, for example, spatial resolution? And lastly, how uniform do fields need to be that one calibration is enough? Mm -hmm. So it depends on uh, what uh, aspect you are, you are targeting. So for the calibration, for example, in our uh, methods, there is no really calibration. Um, because, okay, there, is, there might be some calibration to get the green fraction, mm -hmm. depending on the techniques that you are using. So if it's a LIDAR, there is not too much calibration. It's the direct estimates of the green fraction. Or, or by the green, maybe not the green, but you can maybe make a distinction between green and non-green with the intensity of the LIDAR. So it can be a more or less a direct estimates. With the um, high resolution, RGB imagery, it's also a direct estimate. Uh, there is not too much calibration. Of course, there is a question of resolving or segmenting the, the image, but uh, this is um, now quite, uh, let's see, uh, quite mature. Um, and of course, if you are using multispectral imagery at coarse resolution, a coarser resolution, then probably you need some calibration. And probably there will be maybe some uh, residual uh, genotypic effects. Uh, so that's, that, that's uh, maybe a one possible limitation uh, from this technique. Um, and then, of course, if you speak about the estimate of the biomass, uh, yes. there, what, what we said previously, you need a very strong calibration because it's all indirect relationships. 
Um, so for the resolution to get the green fraction with RGB of or LiDAR, uh, it depends on the size of the elements. Uh, typically, uh, for typically you should have um, pixels uh, or footprint uh, of the LiDAR that are uh, at least a, a fraction of the average size of the elements. So what we are using, for example, on wheat, typically it's, uh, let's say, half a millimeter or, or one millimeter, if you want to get a good uh, estimate of the uh, uh, green fraction from segmentation. Yeah. Um, uh, for, for the LiDAR, it should be about the same, even though there is not currently, uh, uh, let's say, LiDAR that, that have got, uh, or, 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 um, let's say, well spread uh, in the market, uh, LiDAR that have got uh, such uh, high resolution, it's more or less a uh, few millimeters, but mm -hmm. that's, that's still uh, enough for, uh, for wheat when you compare these uh, estimates of the green fraction with the LiDAR, with the one with the uh, RGB imagery, which could be some kind of reference. Um, so, so I would say that it's around the millimeter for, for wheat crops. Uh, for for my for let's say for crops that are uh, bigger elements, uh, probably it's uh, around uh, let's say a few millimeters or up to, to one centimeter. But after that, probably you will uh, you will lose in terms of accuracy of, of the green fraction um, significantly. Thank you very much. <clears throat> so there has been another question by Andreas Hund. Do you have experiences with two images, one at zero and one with 15 to 25 degree? Would this be significantly less efficient as compared to your proposed zero and 45 degree? Yes, yes, yes. It's, uh, it's very significantly uh, less efficient. Um, so the, the, the reason is that, uh, so, so, so we, we conducted uh, with uh, Shu Yang uh, a dedicated study on that, uh, trying to, um, to investigate uh, all the combinations between uh, directions. And we came out, we came out with this uh, optimal uh, set of direction, zero degree and 45 degree. So the reason behind is quite simple. So at 45 degree, you are almost insensitive to, to the leaf inclination angle. Uh, so you have a more or less direct estimates of the green hour index. Mm -hmm. If there is no clamping, but at this, uh, when you are per perpendicular to the row and at, at this inclination, there isn't too much clamping. Uh, and then at zero degree, you are very sensitive to, to the uh, leaf inclination, to the uh, average inclination angle. So that's why it's, it's it's uh, the best combination. So if you decrease uh, the difference between those two directions, uh, then you lose uh, in, in, uh, in accuracy of the estimates of the green hour index and the average inclination angle. This in turn um, means that, of course, in other crops with uh, different uh, leaf inclination angles, this might be also um, different, right? Uh, I'm not sure. I, th I think this should be uh, quite uh, general. Yeah. Um, yes, I'm not sure it, it would change uh, very much from one crop to another. Uh, what what may change is uh, maybe some clumping that may appear at uh, particularly when looking at at zero degree. Um, and so you need probably uh, a specific calibration. For, for crops like sunflower, for example. But, but the optimal direction should be close to that. Okay, another question by Andreas Hund is uh, concerning the harvest index. How close could we get to grain yield by quantifying the size and number of ears in the image? Uh, okay. <laughs> so the number is not too much a problem. As Andreas knows, <laughs> hello Andreas. <laughs> um, then the size, then yes, yeah, size is it's more difficult because again uh, there might be some uh, 
So there, there might be some relationship, uh, I'm sure, but with, with uh, probably large variability uh, because uh, there might be some florets that have uh, aborted. And then the, the size, more or less the length, at least, of the ear will not be too much affected by that. Um, and also, the, you, you don't, so you see the envelopes. Uh, for example, when, when the, the, the ear is coming just after, after uh, flowering or just after earring, then the size of the ear is, is, doesn't change too much from this uh, early stage uh, to maturity. Of course, there is some, some slight increase, but it's from that, that's my perception. This has to be proven. Uh, but my perception is that the, the increase in terms of size. So for the length, I'm sure that it doesn't change uh, too much. For the, uh, let's say, the diameter, maybe there is some increase. Uh, but I'm not sure that we have the capacity to, uh, uh, let's say, to, to have first uh, very uh, detailed estimates or very precise estimates of the diameter. Um, and second, even if we see the diameter, it's a diameter defined by the envelopes, and then the grain is inside. And if for any reason the grain uh, doesn't feel uh, very well uh, because of, uh, I don't know, uh, too hot temperature or water stress or some disease or whatever, uh, then probably we will not see that. Uh, so, okay, that, that's my feeling. It's a feeling, it's not a proof. <laughs> Um, by the way, Andreas, you have the possibility to, to uh, answer or um, make comments yourself. Your microphone is open. Do you hear me? Yes. Hi. So, you know, the, I, I have the feeling then you don't feel so alone there. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, yeah, thank you for that answer. I figure that actually it might be an upper estimate of the potential in a crop if you have the size, right? And the yes, numbers. Yes. But of course, yeah, now you're, you're not able to estimate what kind of Florida abortion was happening, but that could be factored in in a different manner, actually, earlier on by estimating stress happening or something. Mm -hmm. Well, still, it would be probably, yeah, not fun, but good to try to, to, to see what, if you could actually get the potential the yield potential by estimate the number and sizes of the of the ears. Yes. But again, as you said, it will be a difficult task because the ears are, are actually changing positions and and stuff. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. No, no, I agree with uh, the potential. Yes. It's. Uh, I think also the the if we are able to estimate, let's say, the green R index or the uh, the biomass, if ever, uh, at, at flowering. It's also a very good uh, estimate of the potential yield. Uh, exactly. And that might be kind of getting even better if you have a number of years done. Yeah. Mm. One challenge could also be to really adequately um, take up the, the true number of years um, via imagery, right? Mm. But this is, this is now, I, I think we have now quite, quite good uh, algorithm tool estimate the, the number of years per uh, density of years. So this is not the main meeting factor. The main limiting factor is to know, um, let's say, the, the mass of grain for each year, or the number of grains, and then their mass. That's, yeah. OK, Andreas, you had a couple of more questions. Um, do you feel free to answer, um, uh, to, to, to ask them uh, yourself, maybe? Well, I mean, one thing bothering me is actually when is the right moment to do really the bio, the, the biomass calibration harvest. I mean, the most obvious and most simple thing is um, to do that really at harvest and you can just add the straw um, and, and see what, what happens there. But um, I have the feeling that might not be very accurate. The big question is how big will, be, will the errors be, which you make if you're measuring the biomass at harvest and not at flowering, for example, in wheat. But these are different uh, things because uh, between, uh, between between flowering and harvest, of course, the the, uh, the crop is uh, 
is functioning still. So it's producing biomass. It's not only uh, distributing ah. the biomass to the brain, but it's uh, it's producing biomass uh, still and quite sig significantly as well. So th these are two two different measurements. Yeah. So if I had to um, let's uh, to to make an advice for measuring the biomass, probably there will be uh, uh, at least uh, three stages. Uh, so one would be uh, the end of tinnery. Uh, the other one would be flowering, and of course, uh, uh, maturity or harvest. Mm. Uh, because these are very different stages for wheat, at least. Okay. But the essential would be that, that you cover all the stages up to when, when biomass production uh, reaches its, its peak. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And is there a publication on that? I mean, I just wonder how big are the rank changes from flowering to maturity amongst the different genotypes with regard to their biomass? I mean, how, how significant is that changing from flowering to maturity? Okay, uh, that I don't know. <laughs> this is kind of like Tricky. Yeah, yeah, we have to make measurements. <laughs> in regards to the growth rate or in regards to the total biomass um, uh, produced in that stage? Yeah, with regard to the relative, uh, with the total biomass of, or, or the, with the ranking of the different genotypes with their biomass, that means are they all kind of changing in parallel, more or less, and you do not see extreme rank changes, so you can still get the, the genotype ranking out? Or is there a strong change in, in biomass, which is not allowing you to infer what the biomass would be at flowering if you just take it a harvest? I mean, that's the biggest great question I have because we do not able, we are not able to get the biomass. But it, it will depend also a lot uh, uh, on the uh, environmental conditions during maturity, because uh, especially um, if if the um, the genotypes have not exactly the same uh, phenology. Yeah, you, know, right. you, you may have uh, some genotypes more sensitive to uh, stress, for example, uh, than the others. And, and then uh, you, you will have, uh, uh, for example, late, uh, late cultivars will probably have a higher biomass flowering, but then they will have difficulties to fill the grain. Uh, so, so Okay. So Thank you. Okay. So much on your part, Andreas. So, um, would you would you like to ask uh, the last question you sent in the in the chat as well? Depends how many questions uh, you have all in all. So I think I, I mute and uh, you probably let somebody else talk. It was not such an important question for with that regard here. No problem. But if we have time at the end, then uh, I will give you uh, the chance yeah. once more. Um, Felix Arkins had another uh, question. I will uh, open his mic, uh, Felix, if you're okay with it. And uh, feel free to ask your questions directly to Fred. Yes, does it work? It does yes. work. Okay, yes, perfect. Uh, yes, I was wondering why did you specifically choose for the green fraction compared to, for example, NDVI or NDRE? So the uh, vegetation index of the red edge? Uh, because these are not uh, structural uh, traits. These are just radiometric combination of, of bands. Of course, they are related, but the relationship is more complex. So it's much better to uh, directly uh, target the green fraction by, for example, green segmentation or, or LIDAR measurements rather than using um, multispectral imagery that and then compute uh, vegetation indices like NDVI and relate that to, to the uh, fraction of intercept radiation, radiation further. Um, as I demonstrated, the fraction of intercepted radiation depends a lot on the uh, elimination condition. So let's say if you estimate uh, the, uh, the fraction of intercepted radiation at a given time through the NDVI, for example, uh, then it's not uh, how how will you estimate the fraction of interception or the fraction of uh, intercepted radiation for all the time? Uh, it's quite difficult to to do that. 
and so, also uh, yeah it's quite quite um nice that you uh, with your method can incorporate also information on the plant architecture which can be yes. quite vital yes, yes, yes. so yeah. this, this indirect way allows to really take into account the plant architecture and, and the illumination conditions which is not the case with ndvi where you would have uh, let's say uh, uh, a general relationship that may be not too bad that's true right? But uh, but probably will not be able to uh, to make uh, fine differences uh, between genotypes first and second, so linked to the architecture, and second from uh, illumination conditions. If you yeah. make NDVI measurements in cloudy days, uh, and then of course uh, you want to estimate the EFI power anytime along the growth period during every day, every hour in the day. And, and you, will, you will have uh, moments where you have clear, clear sky conditions and the NDVI and FIPAR will be different. Uh, so it's, it's, um, yeah, it's, less accurate. it's possible, but it's less accurate. Yes, okay, that's understandable. I guess also because it's also cheaper usually to measure because you don't need any multispectral or hyperspectrum uh, equipment for it. And you don't, uh, you don't need the hyperspectral. Yeah, um, you, you don't. But I mean, for NDVI, for example, you would need. Yes, yes. Yeah. But, but the, the, I mean, if you are really interested in the green fraction, uh, which is the basis to compute uh, the fraction of intercepted radiation, uh, the, the best way is not to use multispectral or hyperspectral uh, instruments. The best way is to use high resolution, simple RGB imagery. Or lidar systems. Yeah, and uh, maybe another question of mine was because you used, of course, the above ground biomass for your uh, RUE, uh, which is the most common way, I believe. And for wheat, makes also a lot of sense. But in case you would use the different definition of also also including the uh, below ground biomass. Uh, how would your assumption change or what would change or would you think it would be still accurate or would you need to then use a different approach maybe? Uh, no, that's, that's a good question, but it's quite a difficult one as well. <laughs> <laughs> so in theory, the, uh, the Montis equation should apply to the total biomass, including the uh, above ground, but also the uh, below ground biomass. Uh, it has been uh, approximated to uh, just to the uh, above, on, above ground biomass because it's more easy to, to measure. Um, so that's, uh, that's a limitation. And the, the uh, approximation to the above ground biomass, especially when you want to compare genotypes, uh, is valid if the, the let's say, the, the ratio between above ground and below ground biomass doesn't vary too much. Uh, yeah. and, which is, okay, I don't know if it's true. It depends on <laughs> the crops and the genotypes. Uh, so this has to be very fine probably, but yes, you are right. This, this may be- uh, I guess also due to the different stages that the root shoot balance changes quite a lot through the growing season. Yes, yes, yes. For example, in wheat, uh, there is a lot of uh, below ground biomass during tillering. Um, and then uh, mostly the, uh, the above ground biomass is, is, uh, is taking over. Uh, yeah. And it depends a lot on the stages. Yes, you're right. Maybe also in that regard, when you do your uh, estimate um, of with a green fraction and so on, how does the accuracy change throughout the season? So I can imagine that, especially in the beginning with smaller plants, it's probably easier than at later stages, but is there somewhat of a curve of how accurate your measurement is and at what points do you believe it's most applicable to use it? No, I think it's uh, that the, the accuracy is about uh, constant, I would say, uh, throughout, throughout the growth cycle, um, because it's more or less, a, yes, it, it's a linear, um, Yes, what, what, what may change, maybe, 
especially for the late stages. It's uh, when you have very small gaps, which happen sometimes. Mm -hmm. And in this case, uh, you may have some uh, slight increase of, of the uh, errors. But generally speaking, it's, it's quite constant. Because at the beginning, you have, uh, OK, the, the segmentation is quite, it's quite easy to do. Uh, generally speaking, because background and, and, and green, it's, they are quite, quite different, except when they are weeds. But OK, that's another question. <laughs> do you <laughs> include the weeds in, in, the, in the canopy or just uh, focus on the crop? Um, and then, uh, uh, and then it becomes maybe uh, a bit more difficult at the end when you have very small gaps between uh, between leaves and when the resolution is uh, at its limit uh, to uh, to identify the gaps. Yes. Okay. Yes. Thank you very much. Uh, well, may maybe one last very short thing. Have you ever tried to also validate this method on other crops and other spe yeah, other species? And how does it keep up with that? Uh, not yet, no. Okay. <laughs> so, um, we have another question here from the chat. Your mic is open. Yes, um, yeah, can, you can hear me, right? Yes, yes, we okay, do. Okay, thanks. Uh, thanks, Fred, for, uh, for your, uh, sharing your mm -hmm. uh, research. Um, I come from a from photosynthesis perspective, and I don't want to Really, um, so I'm not I'm no expert with any sensors, but I also don't want to jargon you with any other photosynthesis related traits. But what I'm curious at is that when when you show the um, the the equation of Monteith with the, with the biomass accumulation and RUE, I notice that there's an element of of time, uh, and I suppose you use that to measure the changes in in whether biomass accumulation or changes in RUE or FA, FA par um, from time one up to time n. And if we want to use this RUE um, to estimate, uh, let's say, heritability of a trait in a crop to see changes in, in between, between genotypes and between species, um, uh, in a high throughput way, I suppose we wanted to, the aim is to increase the number of throughput for, for a smallest period of time we can measure. So I think my question is, is that, um, OK, we can detect changes in FA par or estimate of FA par the urinary. But how short do you think we can measure them such that we see differences in RUE between genotypes? And, and if that is the case, if we are basing our uh, the model based on greenness, which is based on the chlorophyll. Um, intuitively, I don't see any changes that, that may happen. Um, the urinary that is actually inherently related to the changes in photosynthesis, but yes, because chlorophyll is more or less stable trait. They, they, I mean, what I, I think what I'm trying to say is that um, maybe I'm wrong also, is that um, when we see changes in in the capacity for light absorption. These are changes that is really related to photosynthesis. And if we estimate RUE based on structure, um, this, the, the changes might be due to the angle, sure, but the, okay. um, uh, I think I understand your-, your... Yeah. <laughs> so, Maybe you can help me out. <laughs> I don't know. Um, so what-, what so we, we come back to the uh, Monty's equation. Mm -hmm. So the radiation use efficiency is something that is, uh, um, let's say, quantifying the efficiency with which photosynthesis is transforming light into a biomass. Mm -hmm. um, so of course, it's uh, there are there are two inputs uh, I demonstrated. Uh, so one is the um, total amount of uh, intercepted radiation. That is computed from the fraction of intercepted radiation that can be uh, accurately measured with the uh, high throughput systems. Yes. Um, and the other one is the uh, the accumulated biomass. 
and so and and this is a big problem of course because you don't we don't have uh, let's say uh, proved uh, accurate enough methods from that's my point of view of now but this has to be demonstrated um, methods to to uh, estimate the biomass with uh, high throughput and and with no bias depending on the genotype so this is really a big limitation and then once you get uh, some measurement of the radiation use efficiency, mm -hmm. of course, this radiation use efficiency will depend on a lot of uh, other, uh, let's say, characteristics of the plants. Uh, it can be the, 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 the chlorophyll content. Mm -hmm. uh, it can be, um, uh, I don't know, the, the, uh, let's say the stress uh, that is subjected uh, to the plant, like water stress. Mm -hmm. Uh, it can be diseases, diseases that, that, that may uh, uh, have two, two impacts. Uh, so one is a direct impact on, by reducing the green uh, parts uh, by necrosis or whatever. Mm -hmm. And the other one can be uh, more, uh, more impact on, on, on the, uh, let's say, the, the mechanism of the photosynthesis uh, or respiration uh, directly. Mm -hmm. uh, that will that will uh, decrease the efficiency uh, uh, of the photo photosynthesis. So I think there are there are there are two ways of to approach mm -hmm. the efficiency the, the photosynthesis efficiency. Uh, one is uh, uh, the Monty's equation, mm -hmm. and the other is maybe you can you can approach that with uh, maybe chlorophyll fluorescence. Yeah, uh, probably. Um, but we can also integrate that in the, the Monteith equation, and then maybe RUE will be much more related to photosynthesis. Yes, so, so you, you can, you can uh, develop, let's say, the RUE uh, factor uh, according to different stresses. And that, for example, the, most of the models are based on the radiation use efficiency. And then they are they are modeling the radiation the, the variation of the radiation use efficiency according to the stresses uh, subjected by the plants. It can be water stress, nitrogen stress, or other kind of stress. Um, so that's yes, I think that's that's complementary. That's two two complementary ways to uh, mm -hmm. uh, to to estimate the uh, photosynthesis efficiency. Okay. Um, so that also means that with the um, with this framework that you presented, that's based on canopy structure, uh, estimating RUE based on canopy structure, we will only be able to use it in terms of phenotyping uh, uh, for phenotyping and to see differences between genotypes when we see apparent differences between the structures between genotypes. Yes. Yes. And for, for example, in, in maize, I don't know exactly for wheat, but I know for maize, uh, the selection uh, has been mostly uh, trying to select genotypes that are able to, um, uh, to perform well under um, high density, high plant density. That means more erect plants, more erect leaves, sorry. Mm -hmm. um, and this is uh, very well related to the uh, um, say interception efficiency of the mm -hmm. yeah. So even though you don't have access to the radiation use efficiency, the uh, radiation interception efficiency mm -hmm. yeah. is also by itself uh, a quite interesting uh, trait yes. uh, for, for phenotyping. Yeah. OK. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. So we have uh, two last questions that have been sent uh, to us uh, via mail. Uh, one is from Ono Mola from uh, Ulich Research Center. And he says, uh, thank you for your interesting talk. <clears throat> Do you measure FI power in other crops than wheat? Maybe first. Yes. 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 Which, one, which crops? Uh, so we have measured that on, uh, on maize. Maize, OK. Um, we are measuring that on sunflower. Um, so that's yes, that, that that's possible. Yes. 
what are the most profound um, differences between these um, um, species in regards to measuring FIR? So actually, there, there are two ways to uh, to relate. So it's always related to, to the green fraction. Mm -hmm. And then you are, I would say, two types of canopies. So the canopy that are can that can be considered as turbid medium, which is the case for wheat. And then you can use the equation that I presented, the Poisson model, and that, that, that works very well. Uh, and then there are the other crops, uh, like sunflower, maybe maize as well, um, for which the, the, uh, you, you couldn't uh, approximate the canopy architecture as a turbine medium. So you, you will have to calibrate relationships between the green fraction in the two directions. Uh, to estimate so the fraction of intercepted radiation uh, anytime uh, during the day or during the season. Uh, so, so that's that's something that, that you need to do. But that's uh, but that's not too difficult. This this needs to be done um, uh, with um, let's say hemispherical Im uh, imagery, for example. Mm -hmm where you, you, uh, you, you make uh, a number of hemispherical imagery uh, uh, across different stages, of course, and, and different uh, genotypes. And then you try to, uh, to find a way to interpolate between the green fraction, at least in the two directions. Um, and that, that's, that's the way you can, uh, that's the other way that you can estimate the FE power for any crops. So we have done that for forests, for example, and for forests, it's it's working quite well as well. And um, Ono's next question would be: How does it look if two crops are grown in a mixture? Does that mess up the whole thing, or is that problem uh, solvable? Uh, it depends if you want to get the fraction intercepted by each crop mm -hmm. or by the whole canopy. But let's say by the whole canopy first. If it's a whole canopy, uh, I would I would think that the method is working as well. Mm -hmm. But of course, if you want to uh, to make the, the the partition between the two uh, components, that's then okay. that's much more difficult. Right. I can imagine. How is it with, um, for example, species that respond strongly that which leaf inclinations. Uh, um, depend strongly on the on the course of the sun during the day. Mm -hmm. Yes, that may be. Uh, yes, that may be a problem. You're right, um, because you will make an estimate at a given time. That means you will have uh, an image of the canopy structure at uh, at this time, and then transform that into an estimate of Fe bar. Mm -hmm. But if the canopy structure changes with time, uh, then of course, your assumption will not be uh, valid. So yeah. uh, you, you may have some, uh, some, some error, probably not too large, but okay, this has to be uh, quantified. Yeah. All right, we are nearing the end. Actually, we are already five minutes over the end. However, Fred, um, before I let you leave, um, um, I wanted to ask you, in the future, um, do you plan on attending um, any conferences this year where people might be able to um, once again see you and interact with you? Uh, there will be the IPPN, I guess. <laughs> which, which has been um, just, just recently postponed to next year. Okay. Yeah. Um... And then, no, that's true that uh, currently it's a bit uh, difficult with the conferences because it's uh, virtual and uh, okay, it's not the uh, same, uh, same mood as uh, let's say, uh, classical conferences. Uh, so there, there will be a um, conference in, uh, but it's, let's say, between remote sensing and uh, phenotyping. It, it's uh, organized by IRCEL. IRCEL is the European Association of Remote Sensing uh, Laboratories. Um, yeah, uh, that, that, that's, that's all for, for now. 
for this year. Yeah, then uh, hopefully there will be better opportunities next year, better environmental conditions uh, to have more conferences and to, to uh, meet face to face then. Fred, as I said, uh, we are coming now to an end. Thank you very, very much um, for your time um, and for your work and the results you provide. Um, very, very um, important um, and very interesting insights into modeling of light interception and resource, uh, resource use efficiency. Thank you very much. And we are hoping to hear much more from you in the future. Good luck with your work and all the best to yourself. Okay, thank you very much. It was a pleasure to discuss <laughs> with the colleagues and friends. <laughs> Same from my side. Bye-bye, Fred. Okay, bye-bye. <laughs>